May all that I say and all the chizuk that we gain bring nachad ruach to Hashem Yidbarach. Serve as a schut for Klal Yisrael and Bili Lui Nishmat Shlomo Ben Joy Alava Shalom. To elevate his soul amongst all the other souls, to bask in the radiance of the Shechina. Amen. Amen. And to the Yeshuot of Klal Yisrael. To all Ben Esther and family. Amen. They should make Aliyah Bekarov. Amen. The Simcha Bekalut. As I said. Amen, amen, amen. All the Yeshua to call you swell. As Lat Hashem. Okay, thank you everyone for coming. Thank you for all the viewers on Torah anytime.com. I have two um, uh, announcements to make before we begin the Shi'ur. So, as I mentioned before, Bez Lat Hashem, I'm very excited to be going on our uh, Be Inspired Tour, Bez Lat Hashem, after the Chagim to the States and to Canada, Bez Lat Hashem. Uh, many of my readers have ar already expressed an interest to have me come and speak. Um, if anyone has an interest um, in having me come and speak in the, your community, please contact our um, tour coordinator, Alyssa. Her email, uh, the link to her email can be found on our website, on the homepage of our website, uh, www.dailydoseofemuna.yolasite.com. Second announcement, um, next a Tuesday, Bezlat Hashem, we're planning a very special evening. Many of you have already signed up to join. Um, we're going to be doing the shiur by the Kotel, um, also connecting it, Ulai, we're talking about David Melech. Um, we're calling it a spiritual experience at the Kotel, Bezlat Hashem. Uh, it'll include uh, a light dinner, the reading of Tehillim. Um, uh, beautiful and sure, private diving time. Uh, Bezlat Hashem, we're inviting all women to join us. We have arranged transportation from Ramad Bet Shemesh. We're also talking about stopping in Beitar on the way to pick up other women. Uh, if you're interested in joining, please again sign on to the chart expressing your desire to join us. Um, the link to the chart again is available uh, on the homepage of our website. Again, www www.dailydoseofamuna.yolasite.com Okay. Elul. Um, tonight's Shi'or is a mini anatomy class, biology class, talking about the connection of our bodies and our souls. Bezlat Hashem. Um, the reason why I felt so strongly uh, to talk about the whole connection between body and soul was because by us doing tshuva, we understand that the soul benefits from it. But I wanted us to get the full glim glimpse of the picture. Of, uh, that the body, Bezlat Hashem, can also, uh, will also gain Bezlat Hashem and benefit from the tshuva process. Um, a lot of what we're going to learn tonight um, is taken from Rabbi Nachman's teachings in the book called Anatomy, Anatomy of the Soul. Um, he talks very extensively, very in-depth. I just sort of wanted to briefly surface, get a glimpse of what happens in our body when we act certain ways, when we express our midot in certain ways, what actually happens in the body, how is the body affected by it. And also through doing tshuva, how we're able to refine not only our neshama, but refine that actually physically make a change in our body and create a change, a permanent change in our body. So it's, it's a beautiful connection and I just felt that it, gave a, it would give us a bigger and a nicer, broader insight of how to really benefit from, like I said, the tshuva process in Elul. So each body part, every organ, every vein in our body holds within it a spiritual concept a spiritual power and one of the ways that we're able to um, release that spiritual power from that organ and that would eventually allow us to be elevated to elevate our material form is through a ratzon when a person has an intense yearning desire craving to come close to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, then what happens is they tap into that spiritual energy in that organ, in that body part, and in essence what happens 
is they release that spiritual, uh, they re release spiritual power into the body, and that spiritual power elevates, again, that organ, that body part, that tissue, that muscle, and in essence, not only allows it to bring itself to that tikkun, but also, again, allows us to exert more control over our body where the, where the neshama, the soul, has more control and exercises mastery over the body. Um, just like Moshe Rabbeinu, who is a, human, was, is a human being, but at the end of his life, he reached the dargah, he reached the level of Isha Elohim. And how did he reach that dargah? How did he reach that level? He reached that level through his yearning and his desire to want to come close to Hashem. His ratzon was so strong that he elevated himself to such a high level that he was able to be called Isha Elohim. So yes, this is an ideal persona of where we'd like to reach, and, but it's something that we should understand that we can, you know, we're soon going to be learning that how we can really reach that level of becoming a tzaddik. So in order for us to understand where this whole separation and conflict began, we of course have to go back to Adam Rishon. And we have to understand that Adam Rishon had also a very intense yearning to want to know Hashem, to want to connect to Hashem. But the problem was is that he used his yearning and instead of taking his yearning and, 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 and using that desire to want to come close to Hashem through reaching out to Hashem and asking Hashem for help, by using his temptation and crying out and reaching out to Hashem, he could have reached that level of getting to know a Kaddish Baruch Hu. But what happened was, is he got lured by his temptation and wanted, quote unquote, an easy way out and got lured to get to know Hashem through, through a simple one-time act of, let's say, <coughs> eating the apple, which of course there's a lot of secret messages in that. It's not necessarily that, but for <coughs> argument's sake, we're going to say through eating the apple. So what we understand from here is that it's not enough to just yearn, but we have to understand that that yearning needs to be applied in the proper way with the right attitude and going in the derech of, to of Torah, done gradually, right? A person who wants to come back to tshuva, he has to do it gradually. It can't be done all at once. There is no simple skula, quick fix. It has to be done in a very consistent, gradual way so that we can reach that level and stay at that level in a, with healthy mind and body uh, as well. So what happened was because Adam Rishon sinned, he got lured into bringing evil and being uh, having it mixed up and confused with good. And we're here to now pay for the price for his actions and having to resolve this conflict between body and soul. So really, this is where it all began. And a lot of this we know, but again, it was, it was important for us to bring this up so that we understand where this all came about. Very, again, very briefly, very much in a glimpse. But again, Rabbi Nachman teaches us that if we want to, we can bring harmony between body and soul. And how do we do that? One simple piece of advice, which is not so simple to apply, but it's a simple piece of advice, and that is show mastery over your bodily desires and cravings. Simple, simple, very hard to do, but simple advice. In other words, if you want to elevate yourself to that level of being a tzaddik, if you want to become a tzaddik, then you have to put your soul in charge of your body, right? And through that, you create harmony and you can infuse the two together and they can be together and live peacefully and in harmony. Now, when we say a tzaddik, it doesn't mean what we usually, when we refer the term tzaddik, we think a person, oh, this one's a tzaddik because he davens all his tefillahs in a minyan and he keeps the highest kashrut and sends his kids whatever. X, y. We have our, we have our, we painted this list of criteria that when it's met, a person is a tzaddik. But Rabbi Nachman says, no, wait a minute. Everyone has their level of being a tzaddik. So in other words, my level of being a tzaddik is not the same as your level of being a tzaddik. So for me, 
my level, my heightened spiritual level, where there I would be called a tzaddik, could mean that I simply have to work towards keeping Shabbat. Whereas for someone else, with a blink of an eye, they keep Shabbat. It's not a problem. For one woman, it could be their nisayon, their level of being a tzaddika is they have to cover their hair. And that's a very difficult nisayon for them. And so when they reach that level and they're able to cover their hair, they're considered a tzaddika in the definition in Shemaim. So when we ask Hashem to become a tzaddik, we have to understand that we want to be termed and named a tzaddik in Hashem's eyes, not in the eyes of my neighbor. Because in the eyes of my neighbor, she's just comparing me to the other neighbor or to herself. And that's not the proper way that we want to define ourselves as being a tzaddik. We want to be a tzaddik in Hashem's eyes and not in our eyes or someone else's eyes. Just some clarity on that. So the purpose of mitzvot, the purpose of all the mitzvot is literally just one and that is, they're pieces of advice, as the Zohar Kadosh teaches us. They're 613 pieces of advice to teach us what it is to refine and how it is to refine our midot, to refine our characters, our ca character trait. And by refining and suppressing the animal urges that we have, we're able to, Bezalat Hashem, elevate ourselves and become more spiritually, um, live more spiritually. And through that, Bezalat Hashem, we're able to, of course, come closer to Hashem. So the mitzvot, in essence, through the action, we become. Hashem doesn't command us to be someone. Hashem asks us, through the mitzvot, to act, and by acting, we will eventually get to that level of becoming that which the mitzvot is asking us to do. So, because a lot of people will say, but it's very, very hard for me to open up my house and, you know, do achnasat ochim. It's very hard. But the Torah says, do it. And eventually, again, our hearts will follow. So, for instance, through the act of giving tzedakah, by giving and giving and giving, even if I'm not doing it with all my heart, I, avenge, I eventually become more loving, more caring, more giving, more empathetic with the other one on the other side of the door. I become that loving person through the simple act of doing. So that we understand exactly, really, those are the, but that's why the Zarkata says there's 613 pieces of advice on how to refine ourselves and come closer to Hashem through doing that going through the mitzvot, and again, the mitzvot don't necessarily mean physically doing something. It could be also by simply yearning. That's also an act, yearning to come close to Hashem. Increasing our kavana, having this desire to daven with more intention. That's also a mitzvah, and that's also, that also has in it the ability to spiritually elevate ourselves and bring us to that place of refinement. Now, our, mid, uh, our midot, parallel to various organs into the body, in the body. And we're going to learn, we're going to really just glimpse through just two, si two systems, mainly one, but it's a little bit extracted from that one, two systems of where we can actually see the connection between our midot and our bodily organs so that we understand how closely connected the two really, really are. The more mitzvot that we involve ourselves in, what it basically means, it's the greater control we show that we have over our bodily desires and cravings. That's really what it is. So the more mitzvot I do, the more spiritual I become, the less animalistic I become, and therefore the more refined I become, and the more control I have over my yetzahara. By knowing how the body works and what its connection is to the mitzvot, what it enables us to do, it, it motivates us, it serves as a drive for us to be able to really, like I said, see the in-depth picture of how much of a profound effect we have on ourselves. That we, you know, we, we're very proud of ourselves when we, when we achieve you know, restraint, for instance, from let's say, wanting to lash out or yell or answer back. We're very proud of ourselves. What I want us to come out with tonight is such chizuk 
that we're not only going to feel it on the soul level, but we're going to actually relate, hopefully, remember the shiur, and relate to it on, our, on a bodily level and really feel our body emotionally and physically becoming more healthier. That's, that's one of the, the, you know, the reasons for the shiur. So Rabbi Nachman teaches us there are three primary lusts that really encompass all the other lusts. The lust for wealth, the lust for sexual pleasure, and the lust for food, to, or eating, eating gratification, gluttony. Those are our three main lusts, and everything sort of is subletted from there. The, the, uh, today we're gonna focus mostly on the craving and the yearning to eat, and the whole digestive system and the whole purification process of what happens to the food. Because that is that primary lust of ours, and one of the reasons is, is because of the fact that we are so involved with food. We, we deal with it every day, all day. We understand that we need to eat in order to live, but unfortunately, a lot of times, we take it, and we excess on it, and we eat not the Shem Shemaim, and we eat for our body, to gratify our body. And um, we think it, 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 in a way, it does tie into our emotions, but basically, really, the, our eating, a lot of times, is for our body. We feel like we need, our body needs the chocolate. Our body needs to eat that steak. Our body needs X, Y, and Z. Um, and we're gonna soon see what the effects of that is. But first, I wanna talk a little bit of just the digestive system as a whole. So the digestive system, really what it teaches us, is it teaches us the whole union of purification. The body takes in the food, the raw material food, and it goes through a whole process. And within that process, of course, the body takes the nourishment, right? Passes the nutrients to the various body parts, and then expels the poisons and gets the body and gets rid the body gets rid of all of the contaminants and the things that it doesn't need anymore. So through the digestive process, we learn the idea of the body taking what it wants and expelling what it doesn't. So just as the body, everything parallels, right? So just as the body knows what it needs and it takes what it needs and throws away what it doesn't, so does our neshama. The neshama knows exactly what it needs. We're busy trying to feed the neshama food that it doesn't want and can't digest and doesn't want to ingest. And we're forcing, you know, food down the neshama's throat thinking, oh, this will buy me happiness. This will bring me to a place of happiness. And it doesn't. The soul knows what it needs. What's the, the food for the soul? It's yearning, it's craving, it's anything that brings me closer to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. That is the food basket in the supermarket. If there's something you could pull off the shelf that feeds my, that's gonna feed my, my neshama, it's whatever I do that will bring me closer to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And whatever doesn't, the soul is gonna reject. And the soul is gonna kick out. And the soul's not gonna wanna hear or have anything to do with anything of that nature. So again, this is one of the parallels, one of the insights that we learn. The digestive system, what happens, the process of, the di of what the digestive system, its, its work, its job, is it goes, again, gradually. It happens over a period of time. It's not an instantaneous uh, system, process. It happens slowly, slowly, in time. First, the body, ha the food has to be inta intaked into the mouth, has to be chewed properly, then it gets put down into the stomach and it has to be slowly digested and absorbed and then the breakaway starts, this goes here and this goes there and it happens gradually, it's a process. So one of the things we learn when we eat consciously and we eat with the awareness of what we're eating, how we're eating, what, what, uh, when we're eating, and so on and so forth, is we learn and we cultivate the mida of patience. What we're understanding is, is that everything takes time. Everything in due time. The Yeshua is going to come in due time, right? The answer from Hashem is going to come in due time. Everything has a time and a place. And no matter how much we try to rush the process, it's not going to happen. 
it's going to happen at its right time, in the right place, in the way that it's supposed to be. Again, learning Imuna through the digestive process. Impulsiveness, which is the opposite, of course, of patience, is a very bad and, and, and negative habit. What happens is, is when we act impulsively, we, we don't exemplify patience, we're not able to weather the storms, we're not able to outwit the negative forces. What, many times what happens is, is we have an impulse, we act on that impulse, and what happens is, is eventually, if we would have waited, that impulse would have, would have eventually passed us by and the craving would have gone. So if I felt like having a piece of chocolate cake and I just waited for 15 minutes and had a glass of water, I wouldn't have, chances are that, that craving of mine would have just passed and it wouldn't have been there. So one of the things that I'm able to polish up when I eat consciously and, and I'm aware of what I'm eating and I don't eat and grab exactly what I, what I right away, my body says, you want that habit, is I'm working on my midah of controlling my, my impulsive nature and being more patient. So that's, again, through the process of eating, we can actually do tshuva and we can actually refine our midot, which I found very amazing and very beautiful. Now in the bloodstream, what happens is the bloodstream carries with it all of the impurities, all of our lusts, all of our desires, they all flow through the bloodstream. In essence, the bloodstream is our animal lifeline. That's where the Yetzahara resides, in our bloodstream, okay? So when we portray ourselves, when we act in a very materialistically um, yearning and craving way, we are flooding our bloodstream with impurity, physically. Okay, now we're not talking about just, again, midot. We're talking about physically, it affects our blood. So I'm not, I'm not, again, I'm not a doctor and I'm not here to offer any homeopathic or any medical advice. What I'm saying is that whoever can relate to maybe some sort of a physical problem on a bloodstream level, should maybe listen closely to what we're about to learn as far as, far as us being able to purify our bloodstream. Um, blood is the color red. The color red indicates gavura, dinim, judgments. In our bloodstream, again, the yetzahara, the lust, the desires, we're seeing all this negative stuff. Those, that's the impurities. The impurities, when we eat out of gluttony, and we, we don't eat properly and not with the right attitude, we effectively, what we do is we flood our bloodstream with koach to the yetzahara. We give koach, physical koach to the yetzahara. And, that, and, then, and, and, it, and it floods our bloodstream with physical impurities. So the spiritual, the act itself, affects physically, again, how our body is responding. Every body responds physically to the, to the spiritual act, to the act of us doing. So again, we're seeing here the connection. So let's, with all that, that negativity now, let's talk a little bit of advice. What do we do? What are some of the ways that we can, for instance, and again, I just chose to this particular topic. There's many uh, systems that we can go through, but now we're just focusing on the bloodstream. One of the ways to be able to purify and cleanse and refine our bloodstream is again, we spoke about this, the act of patience. What happens is, is when we act patiently, we are in essence seizing control over our Yetzahara. Okay, we're exercising control over our Yetzahara. We're saying, hey, listen, I know what you want me to do. No, no, no. I'm giving myself 10 minutes. I'm gonna wait on this one and see if my desire doesn't pass. So we're showing the Yetzahara, no, I have control over you. And in essence, through that control, we're bringing about a purification and we're ridding ourselves of, uh, of, of the impurities from our bloodstream. So that's one way. Damim, damim, which has in it the root word dam. Damim is also another word in Hebrew for money, okay? Money, our lust for money, and our interaction with monetary matters 
affects our bloodstream. If we act in a dishonest manner, if we don't give, pay our taxes, if we don't, uh, if we cheat someone, God forbid, that causes an, an influx, a flow of impurity inside our bloodstream. How do we refine it? The opposite. We act honestly. We give our maser. We give tzedakah properly. We don't, we don't, we don't act in a money-hungry, stingy, greedy way. Again, all this has to do with literally affecting physically our, blood, our bloodstream. Um, also, another word that we can extract from the root word dam is middame. Middame, which means delusional. When we are involved with delusionary thoughts of life, oh, if I only had, I would be happy. All these delusional thoughts, if I only had that house, if I can only afford that car, if I can only have the husband that my neighbor has, if I only had the children that my neighbor had, has, I, sure, I would be a great mother. I'd be able to give lots of love to my husband. All delusional thoughts. When we rid ourselves of delusional thoughts, we effectively cleanse and refine our bloodstream as well. Falsehood. There are many falsehoods. There are many false facts. There's only one truth. So when we allow ourselves to speak falsely, to think falsely, what we're flooding our blood system with is with excessive fluids. We're, ex we're allowing impurities and excessive fluids to flood our bloodstream. When we go back, to that point of truth, to that nikudat emet, to the truth, the truth of our reality, of why we go through what we go through, the truth of the circumstances of our lives, the truth of accepting Hashem's decrees. When we can allow, when we get back to that point, when we get back to that point of truth, we cleanse our blood through that process. So how important it is to remember that when we talk again falsely, it's not that we're just creating, you know, false ideas, but again, this has to do with the delusional idea is that we're actually deluding ourselves because we're believing in something that's not real. It's a self-deception. We're putting ourselves in a place of self-deception and we're actually, again, causing problems in our bloodstream. Now, Rabbi Nachman, um, ah, going back to that. Now, one of the ways, very interestingly enough, to cleanse ourselves from this excessive fluid that comes about through falsehood is by shedding tears. Tears are a product of excessive fluid. Tears are created through excessive body fluid. So when we she shed tears, but spiritual tears of regret over our falsehood, we're actually physically ridding the body of the excessive fluids that were built and brought about because of our falsehood, because of our expressing ourselves falsely or thinking falsely or acting falsely. So that's uh, a key, a very key and important, uh, important key advice. Now Rabbi Nachman teaches us, there is one instantaneous way to purify our bloodstream, very interestingly enough, and that's by remaining silent and interesting, just came to me now. La amod dom. Dom just came to me now. Batuach met Hashem, everything is. When a person stands silent in the face of humiliation or embarrassment, when they want to speak out, it effectively wipes out and cleanses their entire, entire bloodstream at once. And why? When you think about it, when a person is humiliated or embarrassed, what happens? All the blood rushes to our face, right? It all collects in our face. And then what happens after it? It all gets drained. What's the result? We go from being red, gvura, gvura, dinim, now white. White is the symbol of tahara, of cleansing, of purity. So in essence, when we stand 
silently in the face of being embarrassed, in the face of being put to shame, when we want to answer that person back, boy, oh boy, do I want to let him have it. Do I want to give him a piece of my mind, but shh, I'm not answering. What I'm effectively doing is I'm cleansing my bloodstream from A to Z, and I'm wiping away, and this is where it all co comes about the teaching of when a person stands silently that the judgments are cleared from them. Now we see again the physical connection, not just the spiritual connection, but give, getting a glimpse into the physical connection of understanding how that actually physically takes place into, in the body. Another way of putting ourselves, let's say, okay, we don't want to wait for someone to embarrass us, okay? We appreciate the whole instant idea of uh, instant, instant cleansing, but we don't want to, you know, we're not looking to be humiliated. Nobody's asking for an Isayan here. So another way that we could do it, which is relevant to Elul, is by doing the act, performing the mitzvah of vidui, of confession. What are we doing? We're putting ourselves to shame in front of Hashem. We're embarrassing ourselves in front of Hashem. And by embarrassing ourselves in front of Hashem, we're showing we're in control of that which we feel. We're admitting the truth. Again, being metak and that falsehood and all the false ideas. And we're voluntarily putting ourselves in that place of embarrassment in front of a Kaddish Baruch. We're volunteering ourselves to be put in a place of shame in front of ourselves and effectively can actually achieve that same goal of cleansing our bloodstream all at once. Some very fascinating ideas. Another way of, cl of cleansing our bloodstream is through accepting life circumstances and suffering with imuna. When we accept everything with imuna, again what we're doing is what we're saying to Hashem, Hashem, the judgments that are floating in my bloodstream, that Yetzahara that's playing games with me, I know that it's you. It's all from you. Again, I'm elevating my mind and my heart to understand that it's all coming from Hashem. I'm accepting the judgments. I connect it to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. That's one way also that I can directly cause um, a cleansing and a refinement of, of, of the, my blood. Um, so effectively here, we're just again, just a glimpse of ideas of how we can turn over you know, the idea of controlling our Yetzahara and turn over the idea of maybe also through the process of accepting the suffering, sweeten those judgment and be able to lessen them because again, I'm showing mastery over my Yetzahara and I'm accepting Hashem's will over my will and I realize that the blood, the red, the judgments, the suffering is all coming from you Hashem. I'm showing control and Bezlat Hashem that should also help sweeten the judgments. So now we're going to return just a tad bit into the whole idea of the eating habits, okay, and see really what's going on here. I know, you know, tonight really, I guess with all the Chagim coming up, we're going to be eating and, okay, but we're going to talk about also how eating, when it's done in conjunction with the Chagim and Shabbat, how it takes a whole different form. Um, it's written in Mishle. We learn from the Pasuk, the belly of the wicked always feels empty. What does this mean? <laughs> I know, we all have to give a hearty laugh. What does this actually mean? When we feed ourselves, and we feed ourselves because we feel that we're not satisfied, when we crave to constantly feel satisfied, it's unfortunately we're putting ourselves in that place of being called wicked. Because a person who constantly craves and wants and wants and craves and is never satisfied with what he has, he's, he's never going to be happy. And that's termed a person who's wicked. First of all, that also brings upon us, unfortunately, another negative trait, which is called chosah hakara zatov, where when we're not satisfied with what we have, we're not a pre that brings us to a place where we're not appreciating and we're not filled with gratitude over that that we do have. Um, but in general, the person who craves and wants, and it, again, it can come in the form of food. It can mean I just want to eat. I want this. Oh, I see this. I really want that. Oh, that looks good. I want that. By us constantly 
you know, compulsively eating without a mindset, without a spiritual mindset, without seeing it as being for a spiritual purpose, we're unfortunately putting ourselves in that position where the Yetzirah really has control over us and is going to say, oh, don't you want more? Don't you want more? Don't you want more? And you'll, we'll never be satisfied. So that's something very important for us to always um, remain, that should remain clear in our minds. So again, eating habits, the, the whole idea of gluttony is one of the leading lusts because of this, because we're always presented in front of a situation where we have food available to us and we have these choices to make. And, uh, you know, that's one of the hardest, um, you know, lusts to have to actually overcome. So now we're going to get a little bit, so going back just, I'm sorry, just for a minute. So when we do eat on Shabbatot and on Chagim, or we eat L'Shem Mitzvah, or we eat, you know, for the purpose of really spiritually giving us koach so that we could serve Hashem. In essence, the food takes on a whole different route. Even if I do eat a little bit more or excessively or food items that aren't necessarily good for me, but the fact that they're the energy and the power of the Chag or the Shabbat or the spiritual energy that's in that at that moment there, I'm able to tap in more into that energy and I'm able to spiritually nourish myself even though I may be, you know, acting, um, you know, and eating out of gluttony and, and you know, still in essence eating um, physically not, not to my uh, best interest. So now we're going to talk just a little bit about the liver, the spleen, and the gallbladder. I'm telling you, this is totally biology. So the, 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 those are the three primary organs that deal with processing nutrients and expelling impurities. They're the three organs that really are heavy duty, pure, uh, purific involved in the purification process of the food. They're very involved with the food that we eat. Okay, and soon we're gonna see how this affects them and how that they are uh, uh, essentially that affects our midot as well when they're not taken care of and when we eat excessively. So first, we're talking about kaved. Kaved, which is our liver. Why is it called kaved? Because the, the job of the, of the liver is to weigh out the unnecessary substances that we fed our body. So the, the job of the liver is to take that food, okay, take the food that we, that we put into our body and essentially process it, ridding it of the impurities, right? This is the first purification that happens. It rids the, the body of the, of the waste and the poisons that it doesn't need. And we're gonna, it, it, eventually it produces bile, which then it get, gets put into the gallbladder. Um, <laughs> but basically the, the, IG, the idea of the liver is it's the source of anger. And why is it the source of anger? Because the liver is very stressed out. The liver has a lot to, to contend with. It has to deal with all of these unnecessary things that we're feeding it, and it gets very angry at us. Why are you feeding me all this food? Why are you giving me so much work? So they say that the liver is the seat of anger. It's very angry. But soon we're gonna see how it gets pacified, which brings us to the gallbladder. The gallbladder is called kisamara. Kisamara comes from the word mara, bitter. Why bitter? Because again, the, the bile, which is a, uh, a fluid, uh, a yellowish fluid that's produced in the liver, is sent from the liver to the gallbladder. The second step of purification happens in the gallbladder. The bile breaks down through, di through the digestive fats and fluid. It, uh, it, brings, it uh, tears down the fats. And then that bile, it's written actually in Masechet, um, Masechet Brachot. The liver becomes angry and the gallbladder emits fluids to pacify that anger. What are these fluids? The fluid is the bile. The bile that was originally brought into the gallbladder from the liver, after the, liver, the gallbladder uses it to break down further the food, it sends the bile back into the liver and then what happens is that bile cools down the liver. The bile is actually a sign to the liver, your job is done. Your job is done. I've gotten the food, 
now your job is done, you can sit and relax. So that, in essence, that bile that returns back to the liver actually cools it down and it, it calms the liver down. It cools it down. So what do we learn from this? A very, very important lesson. What we learn from this is that the gallbladder teaches us that the bitterness, the bitterness actually at the end gets sent back to heal. The bitterness gets sent back to the liver to actually bring about its healing. So that's the lesson that we learn, the spiritual lesson that we learn from the function of the gallbladder. The spleen has the worst job, the most depressing job of them all, because it's constantly, nonstop, nonstop working to rid the body of foreign substances. Its job is to serve as a protective force in the body so that there's no, no infection, that no infection gets uh, brought into the body. So the spleen is constantly working and working with what? Contaminants, impurities. That's a depressing job. And that's why they say the spleen is the seat of depression. All depression comes from the spleen. And what happens, so we're going to see how we can help that spleen, you know, also get, you know, calm it down and pacify it as well. But the spleen itself also, inside the spleen, also has the seat of material temptation as well. What happens is, is a, one of the greatest sadnesses that we encounter in our lives is when we run after material pursuits. When we run after material toys, and we get all excited and we need this and we need that and we want a bigger this and a more beautiful that and an updated version of this and, and the newest of that. And what happens is, is that at that point, it sits on the spleen and we go and we run after it and we run after it and we run after it. And again, what did we say? When a person keeps craving and running after and running after, it's never satisfied. And that brings about depression and it brings about unhappiness. And where does it sit? It sits on the spleen. So what happens is, is now in order, and now what, what happens is because we're running after excessive lust, lust that we don't need, it creates excessive fluids in the spleen, which brings about a more depressing job for it because now we're flooding the spleen with even more fluids and more, more of a job to get, you know, to bring about purity into the body. And what happens is, is remember we tied before in the idea of tears and excessive fluids. So here is where the tears also play a part, is those excessive fluids that the spleen can no longer handle because the spleen can only do so much. It can only filter so much impurities at a time. So what does the spleen do? The spleen throws and brings those ex excessive fluids to the tear ducts, and then a person begins to cry. So the sadness that's created from those excessive pursuits of materialistic, you know, ideas and delusional ideas of happiness, actually through, this is where the, the tears, which are impure tears, when we cry because we don't have enough or we want more and Hashem, why does she have and I don't have and I really need it and why don't, though, that's where that comes from. Those are impure tears. Those are tears that are not there to actually bring about, you know, a spiritual elevation. It's actually there to rid our body of the impurities. They're, they're, they're tears of, from an impure source. So there's different types of tears. We shouldn't think that all tears are good. Some tears actually work as a contaminant and not necessarily to, to help to purify. Moving to the last part of the body uh, that we're going to discuss tonight, we're going to talk about the kidneys. The kidneys are essentially made up of tiny little filtering units, okay? Its job is to process fluids and, again, to rid the body of waste, okay? And to, of course, distribute everything to its proper place. And the Talmud teaches us in Masachet Berchot, the kidneys advise. All advice, all pieces of advice that are given to us come from the kidneys. And so the, the, the doctors in the medical field say, wait a minute, we don't really need uh, two kidneys. Why do we have a right and a left kidney? We don't really need two kidneys. But here we learn the spiritual reason of having two kidneys, a right and a left. Right advice and left means wrong advice. 
we get advice from two different places. And I'm, I'm going to go through also, I could say it now, that the, the fact is, is one, the right side is the female, and the left side is a male. Is, is, is male. We get it from a female source and from a male source. I'll, I'll, I'll go into that in just a minute. What happens is the, the Maharsha says that the kidneys are where all free will begin. We have choices that are presented to us. You have the right way of doing and the wrong way of doing. It comes from the right kidney, from the left kidney, and we're presented with that choice. So that's where the seat of free will begins, is in our kidneys. And what happens is, is most of the work that the kidneys, that most of the work of the kidneys happen at night when we're at rest. And why? Because that's when a person's most prone to sin at night. The dinim are stronger at night, and that's when a person tends to sin, God forbid, more, is at nighttime. But the kidneys give over the, what? Women as well? Women as well, yeah. Um, the advice that we get from the kidneys, though, is again filtered. It's filtered to us. It's not giving to us directly. In fact, the kidneys have a layer of fattiness that cover them. And this fattiness is created by our material lust. So the more a person is embedded in his material me, in the material me, in my, in my material world, the more thicker the layer of fat <clears throat> he will have on his kidneys and the more concealed the advice will be that he's getting from the kidneys. In other words, he won't be able to really discern really what's true and what's not true. So it's so important for us to try to elevate ourselves as much spiritually and disconnect ourselves materialistically because in essence what happens is is we're giving more koach, more strength to the sitra ahra, to the other side, to the yetzahara every time we act based on our physical and materialistic desires and lusts. And we see this, again, we see this here now physically, how physically it affects us and, and really distorts us and creates more confusion in our lives. Um, the Hebrew word for kidneys is batuchot. It's written in Tehillim, batuchot. Batuchot is very closely re related to the word bitachon, trust. If a person has a strong yearning and desire to live spiritually and connect to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the advice that he is going to get from his kidneys will lead him to a greater and higher level of bitachan in Hashem. <coughs> How important it is again for us, again through refining our midot, through connecting more to Hashem, we see here very clearly, and again, this is, what is a glimpse? It's not even a glimpse of how really connected the whole idea of our body is to our soul and how it affects it and how the more we really allow ourselves just one more thing to satisfy my body, just one more, again, piece of cake, just one more toy. I enjoy it. It makes, it makes me happy. It elevates me, whatever but we don't understand. We're giving food to the Sitra Ahra. We're giving him koach, and he's allowed to, to be dominant over us, and he's taking control over us. So we actually see here again, physically, how this, this happens. Um, so again, the two kidneys, you have one male and one female. Those are our advisors. We have a male advisor and a female advisor. The right kidney gives us advice on how to think properly on how to contemplate and have proper introspection. The tshuva comes from that place. The idea of tshuva, the whole thought process of thinking, where am I? Am I on the right place? Contemplating, where am I, where am I going? Am I on the right direction? That comes from the, from the uh, right kidney. And the left kidney gives us advice on how to hear properly, how to take the truth how, when we finally get to that place of truth, how to take it and elevate it to a higher consciousness so that it actually helps us increase our emuna and our bitachan and our kaddish baruch So from this little miniature, miniature anatomy, anatomy bio, biology class, we see very, very clearly how, again, the way we act, you know, physically, our physical deeds bring about 
have just not just spiritual effects, but also you know, uh, uh, spiritual effects, but also physical effects, and actually it's all in one, it's one unit, and how by refining ourselves and controlling ourselves and acting patiently and being more accepting and loving and understanding that it's all from Hashem, we actually are able to also physically, emotionally, spiritually heal ourselves through the process as well. So the whole idea of Elo is to take ourselves to take ourselves over all of those midot, those um, raw, gross, grossly materialistic midot that are not refined, that raw material, and to elevate ourselves by what? By disconnecting ourselves from that whole idea of pursuing our material wants and needs and lusts. If we, in essence, the advice that's giving to, given to us from Chazal is to place ourselves in exile in the month of Elul. What it actually teaches us in the exact words is to run to a city of refuge, to run away from all of those material pursuits that we have. We are constantly being tempted and, and, and being um, you know, prone and, and you know, attempted to run into that place where we're being told by Chazal, in Elul, run away from it. Disconnect yourself from it. And where is that city of refuge? That city of refuge is I'm going to go into a world that's all filled with Torah. I'm going into the world of Torah. That is my city of refuge. That's where I'm going to find my help. That's where I'm going to find my Yeshua. Is if I em embrace myself and envelop myself all the time in the world of Torah. And also, what are the three pieces of advice to, to, to sweeten our judgments? Is Torah, Tefillah, right? And acts of kindness and tzedakah. So what is the city of refuge? We said that's Torah. What's Tefillah? It comes through tshuva, through talking to Hashem, through speaking to Hashem, communicating to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And what is the idea of tzedakah? We just spoke about it. That through the act of giving tzedakah, we're refining our midot, and we're increasing um, the, uh, uh, the whole idea of being kind to ourselves and to others. That's again working hand in hand with refining our midot and bringing about tshuva and repairing um, ourselves physically and, and spiritually. And now I want to just, to end it, I want to just connect the whole idea of how important it is to do tshuva not only out of yira, not only out of fear and awesomeness, which is really predominantly, pre predominantly felt in Chodesh Elul. And yes, we're supposed to come back to tshuva through that avenue, but Adar does offer us another um, avenue of coming back to Chuva, and that's coming back to Chuva through Simcha. And I wanted to just explore that a little bit because I think it's important that we don't just get caught up with the idea of, of the fear and the punishment and what's going to happen and the consequences. That's 100% important. And that is supposed to be at the forefront of our minds. But we cannot ignore the fact that Simcha is a healing tool as well for ourselves, again, spiritually and emotionally and physically. And coming back to tshuva through simcha is a very important element of coming back to tshuva shlema. Because one of the reasons why we need to find ourselves besimcha through the process of tshuva is because when we're besimcha, we're looking at where am I going with all this? Where am I actually heading with all this whole tshuva process? Oh, I'm getting to a place where I'm returning to my source. I'm returning to my purpose. I'm coming closer to Hashem. Well, if I'm going there, that's a reason to be happy. And so involved with all of that fear and consequence and what's going to happen in all my life, my next year is going to be dictated by what happens this month and where I'm going to reach on that day of, of, of Rosh Hashanah. What am I going to be able to present to Hashem on the day of Rosh Hashanah? What's my, what's my, work, pro, what's my work chart? What, what am I presenting to Hashem? What, what, what is the list of things that I'm presenting to Hashem that I'm going to be working on? Tachlis, what am I going to be working on? That's, that's like the, 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 the work chart that I'm going to be presenting Hashem. So instead of though constantly being involved with that, I also have to look at the aspect of where is it going to be taking me? It's going to be taking me closer to Hashem. And just from me feeling closer to Hashem, through refining myself, through the whole process of tshuva, Bezat Hashem, I'll be coming closer to Hashem. And that in itself is simcha. 
that's why I have to remember to be Basimha when I'm involved in a time of, um, of tshuva. Um, so again, the sadness, the depression, if I allow myself to get to that point in the Chodesh Elul, where again, I can only see the dark side and what's going to happen and what's going to be and I get depressed and look what I've done and I'm never going to be able to get myself clean in time for Rosh Hashanah and so on and so forth. How many times? It's already the 15th of Elul and then what have I done and, and getting, you know, so involved with the trepidation of the month, which again, it's, I'm not dismissing it, it's, a, it's vital. But we have to understand that, that what, is, what is the Sitra Acha? What does the Yetzirah want? The Yetzirah doesn't want us to sin. That's not, that's, not the, that's not what he's after. He's not after the sin. What he's after is the guilty feelings that happen after the sin. He's after the sadness and the depression that follows the sin. That's what he feeds on. Because once he, got, he gets us there, once he gets us to feel so sad and depressed over ourselves, we begin to lose hope. We begin to feel unworthy. We start feeling Hashem has abandoned us. We're lost, we're confused, we're isolated. That's what the Yitzhak Sitra Achor wants. That's what he's after. He's not after the sin. The sin does nothing. It's the, oh my gosh, how did I get, how did I get taken in by this one? This time, how did I fall into the trap? That's what he wants. The tshuva, the tshuva dismisses that. The simcha dismisses that. No, Hashem loves me no matter what. And Hashem gave me the ability to come back to Him. And I'm going to come back to Him. And I'm going to mean it. I'm not just going to pay lip service. I'm going to mean it when I say to Hashem, I love you. And I know you love me. And I know that all the midot are shining upon me right now. All 13 rays of, of, of Rachamei Shemaim are, are shining on me right now. And all of us right now. And so I'm going to take that light. And I'm going to be besimcha over it. Because I, I know that Hashem is giving me this opportunity to come back to Him. I'm going to work on my simcha as well. Very, very much so this month. And I have to tell you, the other day I found myself in, in such a low low. I, I felt that I, I, I was almost involuntarily crying over certain things. And I was upset at myself because I was upset. That's the worst part. I was, uh, why are you, this is what you're upset at? Look what people are dealing with in this world. This is what you're upset at. And I couldn't stop myself. And I said, that's it, that's it. You know what, I can't, get, I can't get control. I felt like I honestly was not able to control myself. No matter how much I, I spoke to Hashem, I just couldn't get myself out of it. I put on music and I entered the kitchen, I blasted it and I just started singing. And before I knew it, I was totally out of that state of depression. I was in a bad place. I was really able to like quickly take myself out of it. And again, it, I didn't say that the process that led up to it wasn't important. But the final touch of it was singing, singing in the sweetness of knowing that Hashem is with me and that Hashem is rooting for me and He's cheering for me and He doesn't want me to stay in this place and I have the backing of His Amuna in me that I am not going to, you know, stay there. I, I, that gave me the strength to say, I'm getting out of here and I'm getting out of here quick and right now. So again, this is just something that happened to work for me and Bezlat Hashem, I think it's very important, you know, doing tshuva to the, to the songs of music and to the sweetness of, of tefillah that's heard through music is a very different type of tshuva. It's a very different type of elevation and Bezlat Hashem, that's one that we should, uh, you know, not forget in the whole process of Elul. Um, so from tonight's shiur, I pray really that we should understand that we can and we can give to our body exactly what it needs. And we do give to our body exactly what it needs by elevating ourselves, becoming more con conscious, heightening our awareness of what we do, how we do. And now, again, just by glimpsing into some of the effects of, of our actions on our physical bodies, hopefully, again, we'll be able to remember that the next time that we find ourselves in a position of either eating or lack of patience or impulsiveness or wanting to answer back. These are just a few midot that we touched on tonight. But hopefully we'll be able to relay back, again, I'm not only gifting my soul with this heightened beauty and, and refinement, but I'm also, Be'ezlat Hashem, going to be able to refine my body in the process as well. So Be'ezlat Hashem, I pray to us that through the koach of this month, we should be able to bemet, strengthen ourselves, refine ourselves, never forget that Hashem loves us, 
and Bezat Hashem be matzlech to really do tshuva shleima amen.